polymerizing amino acids into polypeptide chains. This is a ball and stick model of a generic amino acid. You can identify the amino group, the carboxylic acid group, the central carbon, and the R group. In water, both the amino and carboxylic acid groups are ionized. Two amino acids can combine through the formation of a peptide bond. This condensation reaction involves the release of water. The resulting bond is known as a peptide bond. And there it is. We can add amino acids to the ends of the polypeptide. Typically, in biological systems, this occurs only at the C-terminus. This process can continue and generate extremely long polypeptides, some over a thousand amino acids in length. Unlike simple single bonds, peptide bonds are relatively rigid. They act a little bit like bonds and a half. Generally, R groups are in the trans configuration, that is, on the opposite sides of the peptide bond. The cis configuration is gener generally energetically unfavorable, although you can probably imagine that the size of the R group makes a difference. There is free rotation around the other bonds in the chain. The atoms of the peptide bond are also hydrogen bond acceptors and donors. Up to this point, we've been talking about peptide bonds made between amino acids. But things are a little different when we use the amino acid proline. Here we're going to make a peptide bond with a proline added on to the C-terminus of a polypeptide. You can see the peptide bond. Now you can ask yourself where the next peptide bond would be made. A little different from the way it was before. So now answer these questions. How does incorporation of a proline into a polypeptide chain influence the polypeptide chain structure? And how does the size and charge on adjacent R groups influence the rotation around the peptide bond?